So I can end up on dark. Oh, yeah. All right, uh, good evening everyone. I hope uh, you had a spiritually enriching weekend. Uh, back to the uh, latest news and developments in the country. Of course, let me first start uh, with expressing my deepest condolences to a very good friend of ours, uh, Jano Gibbs. Of course, na confirm uh, overnight na ang kanyang ama, of course, si Sir Ronaldo Valdez uh, has already uh, passed away. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 really a sad thing. Uh, in in fact, uh, just back in October, namit ko silang magama. Uh, they're really fantastic people, uh, decent people, wonderful people, kind people. So in in these very difficult moments of grief, uh, you know, I just want to send my prayers and love to our very good friend uh, John Gibbs and uh, you know the the loved ones and the family of the the uh, the late great actor. So uh, I'll try to catch up Siguru with uh, Johnny Gibbs as soon as uh, we'll have more details about this. But in the meantime, I think we should just respect their privacy and allow them some space for grief. Now, let's go to the Philippines, uh, Philippine politics, also Philippine foreign policy. A lot has been happening over the past uh, 24 hours or so. Uh, of course, President Marcos Jr. is back once again from a foreign travel. Of course, our president got... Well, just in time, he recovered from COVID-19 in order to join other ASEAN leaders for the 50th year commemorative friendship and cooperation special summit between Philippines uh, and Japan. And a number of big agreements were signed on the sidelines, including a comprehensive strategic partnership between Malaysia, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim, and Japan, and not to mention also the Philippines and Japan continuing their discussions over a potential reciprocal access agreement, a kind of a visiting forces agreement uh, under which uh, Japanese self-defense forces, maritime self-defense forces, uh, will be able to conduct regularly exercises on Philippine soil. So before we go to that, let's also give a signpost. No? Uh, Pag-usapan din natin yung manangyara sa loob ng Pilipinas. Uh, of course, there's been also a statement by the president. We know that every time President Marcos comes back from abroad, he he feels refreshed and he feels refreshed enough to make some statements about developments at home, including perhaps the most important story in Philippine politics for the foreseeable future, which is the relationship between the House of Duterte and House of Marcos. As far as President Marcos Jr. is concerned, he called the matter of Vice President Sara Duterte's confidential fund issue or controversy or scandal, however you want to put it, as quote-unquote settled. INK President Marcos Jr., that was actually the initiative of the Vice President. I'm not actually talking about the confidential funds and to not insist that they have such confidential funds. So I think as far as I'm concerned, it's a settled issue. Now, whether the House of Duterte and House of Marcos are fully going to patch it up, very skeptical about that but whether we're going to see a kind of an all-out civil war who knows as i said we have a notoriously conflict avoidant president and of course in a catholic nation with holidays and christmas and new year coming i think there's going to be some sort of good vibes and good feels being thrown around though i am not sure if we're going to see very friendly no you might chummy chummy uni team selfies between sara duterte and uh, President Marco Jr., as we saw in the previous years, year actually, it's just one year, you know. Uh, so let's check out, check that out. Actually, two years, no, no, is it two years or one year? My goodness, okay, no, it's actually the second, okay, that was the 2022, right? So that's just like six months into office, yeah, well, upon third year, okay. Uh, obviously, obviously, uh, there's also another development where we're catching up with a lot of things. 
Uh, as you know, on Sundays is Sabbath day, so for me, no work I, as much as possible. You know, I want to avoid politics or any discussions, but you know, we have to catch up, catch up. So, and already developed, and actually, we just saw a while ago over Twitter is, oh yeah, ma. SMNI friends, SMNI friends and people. Okay, ito, kinasuan ulit si Lorraine Badoy, sorry, Badoy, uh, again, based on charges of libel. Okay, so this is not the first one. I'm going to discuss also another separate issue, civil suit filed by my former colleague and good friend of mine, uh, si Atom Arolio. Uh, he also filed a civil suit uh, against the controversial anchor quote unquote journalists of quote unquote media channel SMNI. So former Bayern Munich representative Teddy Casino actually just canina, no, he filed a two million pesos civil suit against former anti insurgency task force spokesperson Lorraine Badoy uh, and confessed ex communist Jeff I uh, ex um, ex communist pala si Jeffrey Sellis si Caselis for consistently red tagging sorry not not liable for red tagging but again as we know legally speaking there's you know red tagging per se has to still be specified in legal terms whether it constitutes a crime but it could be connected to other crimes including you know libelous attacks no so let's see so we have at least two high profile cases right now uh by figures progressive figures or uh, folks associated with the progressive movement in the philippines let's also try to catch up on that uh, but let me go back first, no? Duns uh, geopolitical developments in the country. Well, actually, in the region. Let's go back to the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea issue. Uh, before we go to the Uni team and the Lorraine Badoy issue, I'm trying to just cover as much ground as possible as we try to catch up with so many developments over the past 24, 48 hours. Now, first, balikan natin itong uh, issue ng uh, Japan and ASEAN bilateral relationship. Let me say this, as far as ASEAN uh, and Japan's relationship is concerned, uh, this is one of the most special out there because the interesting thing with Japan is that it's kind of a linchpin state, no? It's a kind of a stealth superpower. It is part of G7, group of seven of mostly Western uh, countries. Uh, it is a key U.S. ally in the region, well, especially after the Second World War because, you know, United States essentially imposed that situation upon Japan and Japan has stood by it since then, especially after the Yoshida Doctrine under Prime Minister Yoshida in the middle of the 20th century. So Japan is seen as a key ally of the United States, but Japan is at the same time a major force to reckon with on its own. So since last year, actually, Japan has launched a new realism uh, diplomacy, no? And under this new realism diplomacy, Japan is expected to double its defense spending as a share of its gross domestic product. Let me just bring, bring out the relevant article on this thing. Because there was a very important meeting between President Marcos Jr. and Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. All right, let's talk about this. Okay, so Japan is a very important country to us in Southeast Asia and the region. Okay, and it's going to be even more important in the coming years. Okay, going back to this. So Japan actually provides more annual new big infrastructure investment uh, in Southeast Asia than any other power. In fact, way more than China. By 2019, more than $300 billion of Japanese overseas infrastructure investment funds were committed to Southeast Asian countries, and in some countries like Vietnam and Japan, it was not even close to China, which had committed more than just you know $200 billion uh, of infrastructure investment. That's a huge gap between Japan and China alone. We're not even talking about the West. We're not talking about European countries and others who also have significant investments in this part of the world. We're not going to even talk about South Korea and increasingly emerging powers like, let's say, uh, India or Saudi Arabia or Turkey are also pivoting to this part of the world along with post-Brexit Britain. Now, if you look at Japan alone, it has more than matched China in terms of new infrastructure investment uh, uh, commitments. Now, but what makes Japan even more attractive to us in Southeast Asia is the fact that Japan is not seen as a Western country, right? Uh, it's still a nation country, last time I checked. And the way Japan approaches in relationship nila, with countries in the region is also extremely uh, subtle, no? So you never see Japanese leaders, whether it was Shinzo Abe, who visited Rodrigo Duterte in 2017, the first foreign leader, major foreign leader to visit the Philippines under the former controversial president. You don't see Fumio Kishida, you don't see Suga, you don't see 
Junichiro Koizumi. I can go on and on. You don't see Taro Asa. You don't see any of these guys openly criticizing any ASEAN country on human rights uh, and the democracy issues. Now, obviously, that, that's sometimes very questionable, especially we're dealing with horrible situation what's happening, you know, in Myanmar, you know, the coup, coups that we saw in Thailand, among others. But at the same time, there is a value to that, right? You want still a major country, not named China, to maintain that kind of friendly relationship with whoever is in power in Southeast Asia to just create some sort of balance, right? The other thing, of course, with Japan is that it also doesn't force any ASEAN country to take its side when it comes to controversial geopolitical issues. So, for instance, you don't have Japan telling ASEAN countries to join you anti-Russia sanctions, right? Uh, and sanctions on Russia are a very sensitive issue, especially for countries like Vietnam, dahil ang Vietnam po ay nagri-rely on uh, Russia for their most advanced weapon systems. In fact, a lot of weapon systems in Vietnam are in Cyrillic. A lot of their top security people were trained in Moscow, in Russia. Some go back to all the way the Soviet Union era. And countries like Indonesia, for instance, and Malaysia have also tried to get high-level equipment, fighter jets, among others, if not submarines, from Russia. Even the Philippines under Duterte was considering choppers, if not submarines, also for, from Russia. Now, all of those deals have more or less evaporated because of the fear of Western sanctions or secondary Western sanctions under the so-called Katsa. So Japan has joined sanctions against Russia, albeit reluctantly, but it's not a country that is like, you know, pressuring other ASEAN countries to toe the American or Western line. You don't have that. You also have a situation whereby, you know, many ASEAN countries, let's say Malaysia and Indonesia especially, you know, they have their concerns with China. They have their concerns with China's maritime assertiveness. They have their concerns with China bullying in the region and not to mention China treating horribly its own uh, Uyghur or Uyghur uh, ethnic Muslim minority. Uh, China doesn't really have a good record in terms of dealing minorities. Uh, we can have a long conversation about that and some are even accusing China of engaging in ethnic cleansing or something even worse uh, when it comes to Xinjiang, right? Having said that, when it comes to Muslim majority countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, mas malaki yung galit nila sa United States over American policies and American military interventions in the Middle East. And of course, as you saw with the statement by Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim, Malaysia and many ASEAN countries are extremely dissatisfied, no? Dun sa position ng United States on the ongoing Gaza conflict. So when you put all of those things together, in ASEAN, we're really desperate for a kind of a third force or third power. India might get there, but it's not there yet. Uh, South Korea, it's a middle power, but I don't think it can be anything, any kind of a credible alternative. But if you look at Japan, at least economically, it's a big, big force already in this part of the world. And in fact, scholars like Benedict Anderson would argue that over the past century, Japan has been central to industrialization and development of manufacturing in entire Asia, especially in Southeast Asia since 1970s and 80s. Now, having said all of those things, Japan is also increasingly becoming an important defense partner for Southeast Asian countries, especially Yumama territorial or maritime disputes sa West Philippine Sea. So just this year, Japan launched, in fact, this was during Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Manila. We covered that. Uh, I met a cabinet member, a senior cabinet member in Prime Minister Kishida's office. Uh, you know, we discussed Japan's new over official security assistance. So Japan is not only developing its own military capabilities, co-developing sixth generation fighters with UK and Italy. It's not also developing, it's not only developing its own new long range missile systems. So the so-called Jap Japanese self-defense forces are increasing developing cap force projection capabilities, right? And more than that, ang Japan po ay tumutulong sa mga ASEAN countries and South Pacific countries to develop also their own maritime security capabilities, no? So the Philippines, Malaysia, they're all expected to get radar systems worth millions of dollars, more or less for free, because this is under the o official security assistance program, the new OSA launch by Japan. But I would argue that as far as Japan's policy in ASEAN is concerned, if there's one country that's closest to Japan, at least in geopolitical terms, it's the Philippines. No? At pagdating sa Pilipinas, we're not only looking at of official... Uh, over official security assistance. We're not only looking at um, getting more multi-role and Coast Guard vessels from Japan. Let me tell you, all right? Let me tell you guys. Kung hindi dahil sa Japan, I, I doubt that the Philippine Coast Guard would have been as capable as it is today. I mean, we have an absolutely amazing Coast Guard. Some would argue that the Philippine Coast Guard now is the most developed or the, the biggest right now in entire Southeast Asia. 
it's also the most feisty fighting back and pushing back against China's bullying. And a big part of that is Japanese provision of multi-role, increasingly big vessels to the Philippines. And we're going to get even more of those. Now, we're buying these ones. They're not completely, they're not free. Uh, they're based on good loans and grants, but they're not free. But, but you see, the thing that really makes Philippine-Japan relationship special is that Japan is increasingly looking at also signing its own visiting forces agreement with the Philippines. Pag natuloy yan, then expect nyo na hindi lang magkakaroon ng mga balikatan exercises katulad ng meron tayo with America, hindi lang magkakaroon ng karat exercises, other exercises na meron tayo, let's say with Australia for instance, but you're gonna have specialized defense, uh, uh, bilateral military drills between Philippines and Japanese maritime self-defense forces, bilaterally. And we already saw a glimpse of that last year when for the first time since the end of Second World War, Japan deployed its air force you know, uh, for overseas drills with the Philippine Air Force. Back in 2018, for the first time again in post-war history, Japan under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe back then also sent an armored, uh, um, armored unit vehicle, uh, armored vehicle unit, right, sorry, to the Balikan exercise. So you're gonna see more and more of that. And pagdating sa Pilipinas at Japan, of course, a lot of this has to do a lot of this has to do with not only in West Philippines the disputes. Of course, China is very, I'm sorry, Japan is very worried about what's happening in the West Philippines Sea because what happens in the West Philippines Sea will inevitably also impact not only Japan's trade linkages in the region but also Japan's claims in the uh, in East China Sea, Japan's situation in Okinawa. But inevitably, it has one thing or two to do to do also with the situation in uh, Taiwan because kung titignan niyo map, right? Taiwan is smack right in the middle of the of the Philippines and Japan, and the southernmost islands of Japan, or military bases of Japan, to be even more specific, and the northernmost military bases of the Philippines, for instance, in Mavulis, they're almost equidistant to the Taiwanese shores, right? So any future plans to avoid invasion of Taiwan will inevitably require a certain degree of coordination between the Philippines and Japan, and at the same time, with the United States. So, in fact, ang tinitignan ngayon ng Japan is the development of what I call JAFUS, Japan, Philippine, U.S. Trilateral Alliance or some sort of trilateral security cooperation so that they can provide this kind of a triangular, triangular deterrence uh, framework around Taiwan. Paring China ay magdadalong isip bago sumugod sa Taiwan. Because, you know, uh, I don't know about uh, some folks out there, but, you know, the reason why Ukraine was invaded by Russia, among others, it's because Ukraine was weak, because Ukraine had no security alliance with any country. In fact, Ukraine became a neutral country and gave up its nuclear weapons, right? You check, the, for instance, the Budapest Agreement uh, after the end of Cold War. So it was extremely vulnerable. That's why Russia moved in. Had Ukraine joined NATO 10, 15, 20 years ago, then it would have been as safe as many far smaller and more vulnerable Baltic countries. Uh, I've been to some of them, you see Estonia, for instance, which are extremely close to St. Petersburg. They could be invaded by Russia anytime. They're so small and vulnerable, but Russia is not going to dare to attack them at this anytime soon because they fall under NATO's collective security framework. Now, Ukraine had no security alliance, so there was a very weak deterrence to Putin. So once Putin went cuckoo, right, he just went for it. But even no matter how cuckoo uh, Putin has turned throughout the pandemic period with all his isolation and paranoia and KGB, whatever, the reality is that, you know, even Putin would have most likely been uh, deterred from a full invasion of Ukraine had Ukraine had anything close to what the Philippines or Japan have with the United States. Now, Taiwan, technically speaking, is no longer a U.S. treaty ally since the adoption of one China policy and the Carter administration's, uh, you know, full essentially normalization of ties with China, People's Republic of China, at the expense of Republic of China in the 70s. Uh, but the reality is that there's a de facto alliance between Philippines, I'm sorry, between the United States and Taiwan, and there's a real alliance with both Philippines and Japan, just to the north and south of Taiwan. So very important on Philippines to Japan. Now, my hope is, and this is what I've been pushing for, is that my hope is the Philippines is not just a military ally to Japan or an emerging military ally. I, I hope that the Philippines will also leverage this increasing geopolitical importance to get the most possible economic investments, high quality economic investments. I call it the Taiwan plus one strategy. And sa ilalim ng isang Taiwan plus one strategy, ang gusto natin mangyari sana is yung mga semiconductor investments sa Taiwan. Some of the 
some of the semiconductor production moved to the Philippines. Some of the productions that you know Japan was envisioning in Taiwan, perhaps they could also move it to the Philippines. The same for the United States. Taiwan itself can push some of its investment to the Philippines. Not to mention some of the investment pushes that uh, the West and Japan have in Southeast Asia. A lot of that is going to Thailand. A lot of that is going to Vietnam. More and more is going to Indonesia. Not to mention Malaysia as the Silicon Valley of Asia. You want some of that to come into the Philippines and more of that coming to the Philippines. That's why you need a leader. You need a president in the Philippines who can play, you know, juggle both the geopolitical game and also the geoeconomic game. So, pag-usapan natin yan in the coming years. So, the stakes are very high. We know that when Japan invests, they really create jobs for locals. High-quality jobs, well-paying jobs. Anyone who's worked for a Japanese company, a multinational Japanese company, knows. You know, you'd rather work for a Japanese company than, I don't know, a Chinese company for that matter. And we know that when Chinese come and invest... In the infrastructure of a country, they're going to bring their own workers, their own contractors, their own technology, their own engineers, their own bulldozers. There's going to be very minimal participation by the host country, right? Even when they give so-called so aid and all of that. Sila, 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 sila rin na magbibuild yan. So they're, they're actually just creating jobs for themselves, right? And they're giving experience and profile to their own national champions and infrastructure companies, right? That's not the case with Japan. When Japan builds you you know, highways and bridges, it doesn't bring its own workers and all of that. And it, it, more importantly also, there's always some element of technology cooperation and even technology transfer for that matter, no? So these are the things that are very important to keep in mind when you look at the Philippine-Japan relationship. This is a very, very important relationship that, uh, you know, we'll be continuing to, to look at for the coming days. And so, so don't worry about that guy. Now, guys, now, now, ito na, ito na. Let's move na. <laughs> Bardagulan sa loob ng Pilipinas. Nako po, nako po. Okay. So, may balita nung isang araw na ang uh, mga anchors ng SMNI ay, ano na, napalaya. Pinalaya na pala na hindi na daw sila kailangan nandyan sa kongreso. I don't know. Ang hirap kasi magtiwala dahil mga news tas hindi pala confirmed. Pero tingnan natin dito kung... So, I don't know. Mukhang they're looking at doing something about the situation of SMNI. Hindi ko alam kung matatanggalan sila ng franchise this year or not. But, I think news na nakita natin the other year na uh, sorry, the other day. Ito, ito, ito. Tignan natin to guys. Ang dami kasing fake news eh. Kaya kailangan natin talaga double check lahat. Ito, ito. Okay. So, may balita nung isang araw na para may court order daw. Ito, ito. May court order daw pa... Uh, kung saan dapat palayain na nila itong mga quote-unquote journalists na yan. So, the House Committee on Legislative Franchises is not a court issued the release orders for the two SMNI hosts citing humanitarian considerations. Alright? So, hindi siya court order. Ito ay galing sa... Ito ay galing sa actually just the committee. Alright? So, hindi na kaya alam yung judiciary branch. So, you see, the, yung ito mga technicalities na yan ay mahalaga. Alright? So, yung detention nila actually ay sa ilalim ng ating legislatura, hindi po uh, damay dito ang ating judiciary. Ang problema kasi, may mga nagkakalat ng fake news, surprise, surprise, ng Sunshine Media Network International Anchor, sila Lorraine Baduy at si Jeffrey Celis, ay na-release from detention in the House of Representatives on December 12 through a court order. Parang ibig sabihin, parang binubuli daw sila kunyari ng uh, legislatura natin and then pumasok itong... Uh, Itong judiciary at uh, pinalaya ang ating mga bayani. No? Nag-prevail ang hostisya. Alright. Why we fact-check this? So correct, mat matino itong fact-check na yan. I appreciate ko yan. Uh, ayon sa Rappler, is that the claim cannot, can, can be found in the titles of several YouTube videos, not only video uploaded on December 12 by the channel Pinas News Insider, titled, Kakapasok lang biglang utos, walang nagawa ang kongreso, utos ng korte, pinalaya agad ka Eric Baduy. Ayan talaga, ang dami talaga mga fake news dyan. Other YouTube channels with videos bearing similar claims. Ayan, alam na natin yan. Anong, 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 anong pinaggagawa nila? Ayan, X-Crew. Ang pangit naman pakinggan. Pinas Uncover News Trends. Parang kilala ko News Trends na talaga malakas sa uh, fake, fake news production. Tumawa walang yung yan. Alright, the bottom line, it was a house committee, not the court. That freed Badoy and Celis from detention a week after they were held in contempt by lawmakers. Oh, kamusta naman yung kalagayan nila? Kamusta na? Yung kamusta yung, oh, yung hunger strike nila? Nakita nyo ba yung itsura ni, ano? Yung itsura ni uh, Ninoy Aquino, nung, nung, nung hunger strike. So just to give you an idea, if you do a real hunger strike, ano magiging effect nyo sa'yo? Because 
you know. At in the case of Nina, ang tagal yata ng hunger strike na, di ba? How many weeks yung hunger strike niya? Grabe, kasi nakita ko yung picture niya dun sa, ano eh, uh, dun sa post ng kaibigan natin, si historiador na, na si Xiao Chu, ah. May pinost siya dun sa, na, yung iba dyan, wag, wag kayo mang pa-hunger strike, hunger strike, kung hindi niya alam talaga ano to. Kasi grabe, kung talaga nag-hunger strike ka ng gusto, ng one week, two weeks, or more, may mga lumalampas pa ng isang buwan yata, eh, di ba? I mean, Kaya naman ng katawan natin ng medyo matagal-tagal as long as pa sa may tubig, di ba? Uh, so, ito, ito, ito. Saan, saan yung image nito? As in, kasi, oh, ito, ito, guys. Ah. Tingnan nyo naman, oh, grabe yung itsura ni, ano. As in, hindi siya ma... Hindi mo siya ma-recognize, ah. I, actually, I didn't know na ganun kagrabe pala yung hunger strike na ginawa ni Nini Nyoy nung panahon na yan. Ito, ito. Grabe. Parang hindi mo siya mga makilala. Ay, pat naging ganyan? Sorry. Ay, sinatin. Oops. Ayan, kasi walang production team tuloy. Dapat mag production team para diretso na. Ito, ito, ito. Okay, guys, ay popost natin yun. Grabe yun, ha. Nakita nyo ba yan? Yung picture ni Ninoy? Yung ito? Grabe, no? Ito, oh. Ito yung nakita ko. As in, hindi siya, parang hindi mo siya ma-recognize, di ba? Parang sobrang iba talaga yung tura niya. Don't worry, yung mga ka-spacer at ka YouTube natin, popostin natin itong copy ng video na yan. Kasi... Yung OBS ko, ginagamit ko lang dito sa sa Facebook eh. Hindi sa lahat ng platforms. Alam nyo man, kailangan natin play safe. I mean, like, hindi siya recognizable. Di ba? Kasi yung Ninoy na alam natin, ganito yung itsura, di ba? Di ba? Ganito yung itsura. Parang layo, di ba? So, kung talaga mag-hunger strike ka ng big time, na you go all in, grab your, your physiognomy is gonna be unrecognizable almost. Alright? Eh, ito, di ba? So, parang the Pinoy that we know, I sorry, the Ninoy that we know, it looks like that. And then, nung nag-hunger strike siya, almost totally unrecognizable. Di ba? Di ba? Parang two different people ang tinitignan mo dito. Grabe. So, I mean, just giving idea, guys. You know? I mean, hindi dapat, ano eh. You don't take lightly yung mga terms like hunger strike. You know? Because this is, this is something very deep, profound, and spiritual. You know? Something very deep, very profound, and spiritual. So, yung pong tinitignan natin. Kasi kung talaga mag-hunger strike ka, dapat handa ka na to go all the way. Yeah, literally buwis buhay siya. Diba? Literally buwis buhay siya. Very risky yan. So, I don't know kung ang, ano ba yung kalagayan nila. Pero pinalaya daw yung mga yan. Yung mga quote-unquote journalists na yan. Dahil medyo ano daw, on humanitarian conditions or reasons. Now, speaking of humanitarian conditions or reasons, let's talk about human rights. Because, of course, isa sa mga pinakamalaking concern na uh, laban sa mga quote-unquote journalists na yan ay yung kanilang track record of red-tagging people right and left. Including, of course, people close to yung ating former colleague na si Atom Aurelio. Araulio, sorry, Araulio. Ginawa kong Marcos Aurelius. Atom Araulio and uh, also former congressman and uh, longtime journalist, veteran journalist, si Teddy Casino. No? So, both sila, now, nagsampa sila ng kaso laban sa... laban sa mga quote-unquote red taggers na yan na... Puti pa sila, may humanitarian conditions sa kanila. Pero nung, kung yung mga tiniretag nila, ako gusto naman. Okay, so, si Bayan, former Bayan Muna representative Teddy Casino Monday filed a 2 million pesos civil suit against former anti-insurgency task force spokesperson Lauren Baduy at uh, si Ka, eh, Ka Jeffrey Celis. Okay, what? Pat Eric ang sinabi ko? Wait lang ha. Lapos ka natin itong dalawa na to. Both na nagreklamo sa kanya. Ito, ito, ito. Oh, ito, ito. Okay, so... Tulad na nakita nyo, dalawa sila dito. Okay. So, purong 2 million peso, parang ano, ito na yata ang ano ngayon, ha? Kasi alam niya naman, uh, yung red tagging na yan, parang hindi pa siya legally speaking, uh, you know, in a clear-cut sense, 
a criminal thing no so ang ang ginawa nila ngayon is to take the civil suit uh the kind of a damage civil uh, damage civil suit kind of route uh we'll have more discussions about with that with the legal experts on this issue so now you have essentially 4 million pesos no um that uh, these people will have to well at least in the case of Bado he has to pay if ever found guilty siya uh in both cases and i'm not uh, sure that this is going to be the last of it so this legal action on Casino is long overdue since 2020 these two characters characters talaga <laughs> character talaga no parang ano cartoon sa aided and abetted by the ntf lcac national task force to end local communist armed conflict have been falsely maliciously and repeatedly accusing me of being involved in terrorism rebellion and other crimes as a supposed high-ranking official of the cpp npa ndf all right um ayon sa kanya, they have been consistently spewing lies aspersions inciting ridicule and hate against me my family my fellow activists and our legitimate political beliefs and activities Lorraine calls me a communist terrorist even if I'm not involved no? in the armed struggle. Don't espouse the violent overthrow of the state nor incite or recruit people to do so. Ayon sa kanya, the right tagging continued when Laban para sa Bayan, an SMNI television program started in July 19, 2021, where even his stay at his own province was branded as a covert act of the CPP NPA. Aba, meron, meron parang program na ganyan, laban para sa bayan? Ayan, ibang klase naman to. Sabi ni Casino, as a leftist activist, I have been called many things by many detractors, but to be falsely and repeatedly accused of being a high-ranking official of an organization uh, designated by the Anti-Terrorism Council as a terrorist organization and accused of orchestrating the death of thousands of individuals from the country is just too much. Alright, bastusan na to humaga. Sabi ni Casino, by crossing the line, eto mga to, have repeatedly committed abuses in the exercise of the right, thereby causing injury and damages. So si Casino is asking the Makati court to issue a cease and this is order from red tagging him in order to pay damages for the falling. Moral damages of 1,100,000, exemplary damages of 500 pesos, nominal damages of 500,000 uh, 500, pesos, and attorney's fee of no less than 100,000 pesos and cost of the suit, right? But ayon sa sinabi natin, ito yung hindi, ito yung first time na nagkaroon ng civil suit laban sa dalawang quote-unquote journalists from a quote-unquote media channel. On July 20, broadcast journalist, my former colleague in GMA Network, Ato Maralio, also filed a civil suit against these two individuals, characters, personalities, quote-unquote journalists. Uh, ito ay dahil yung kanyang ina, uh, Bayan Chair Emeritus Dr. Carol, uh, Carol Aurelio also filed a separate separate civil suit against Badoy and Celis. Sought for comments, sabi ni Celis, uh, he branded the case na ito as pure harassment. Aba, ba, 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 Siya pang, ano, siya pang nakakomplain. Siya pang victim. Siya pang, ayan tayo eh. Siya pang victim. Yan talagang, yan talagang minamahal talaga natin sa Pilipinas eh. Siya pang victim, di ba? Siya pang victim. Okay, sabi niya, hindi ako naratakot na harapin ang kanyang civil and damages case. This is purely harassment and pananakot for me and Dr. Lo Lorraine Badoy. Yan, dun sa mga hindi marunang magtagalog katulad natin. Ang ibig sabihin niyan, I am not afraid to face his civil and damages case. This is purely harassment and intimidation for me and Dr. Lorraine Badoy. Alright, interesting. Very interesting. And dumadami ng mga trolls natin dyan sa YouTube. Welcome to the discussions. Okay, now, speaking of pa-victim, I found something very interesting a while ago over my email. I don't know, I, all sorts of groups add me to their email list without my permission and send me weird stuff. Don't worry, not ca that kind of weird stuff, more of like geopolitical weird stuff. And bigla nakita ko, eto, 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 speaking of biglang naging victim pa, nakita ko bigla kanina, may sinan pa sila na isang artikulo, supposedly by, a, by an expert daw. No, may an expert daw ng Asian Century Think Tank. Ayan na naman. Ayan na naman itong mga to. Ayan na naman sila. etong batang bata pa. Expert na expert na. Ayan. Ang title ng article na yan ay Philippines Provoke China's Water Cannoning at Ayungin Like, this is just so ridiculous. This is just so 
dumb, I'm sorry to say, that you know, it was, it's not even worth reading. But I'm not totally surprised at all na may mga kaibigan tayo, yan, makapili, <laughs> na ang sinasabi nga, uh, parang Pilipinas pa may kasalanan <laughs> for detentions that is brewing in the South China Sea. Let me be absolutely clear. That's classic gaslighting. To say that the Philippines is creating trouble by asserting its own rights, sovereign rights, legitimate rights based on prevailing international law, to say that yun yung mali, Union provocation, I mean, that's a term they use, provoke, no? That's ridiculous, but actually it's worse than ridiculous. You know what I'm going to say, right? But I'm not going to say it, but you know what I'm going to say. Basta, makapili. All right. So for me, it's ridiculous. Only in a country like the Philippines, you're going to find people, so-called experts, so-called think tanks, right? And naman mga kote-kote, parang esmen. Ang Pilipinas pang sinisisi for rising tensions, diba? So talagang ibang klase talagang Pilipinas, eh. But you know, all of this goes down, ultimately, all of this goes down to what President Marcos Jr. is going to do. It is President Marcos Jr. who is the commander-in-chief. Very strong president. Okay, let's see what our very... Now, as far as our very strong president is concerned, he seems to be not interested in picking a fight with Duterte all the way yet. Yet. All right. Okay. But nevertheless, he had a statement about the whole confidential fund situation once he came back to the country. I mean, that's more or less that's where president the president bothers to say anything, right? When he comes goes abroad, which is quite often, and he comes back and he gives a press conference, and then that's where you get you can get to ask him some important questions about what's the state of affairs in the country. Because most of the time, we we only get to know about what's happening about this government through you know the proxies of the president, right? People in the Congress people in the cabinet and you know a lot of them are making very strong statements against china against the dutertes but you know, at the end of the day it's all it all goes down to president marcus jr right the buck stops with him no so speaking of president marcus jr <laughs> okay downplaying the whole uniting drama all right So, katulad ng discuss na natin kanina, sabi ni President Marcos Jr., the whole confidential fund issue is settled. At yung, uh, sabi na, yes, I think, okay, so Marcos confirmed na House Speaker Martin Romualdez er, er statement that he will sign the 2020 budget on Wednesday. He said it will be scheduled for Wednesday. So, in, in short, you know, he's trying to dismiss the whole thing and saying, you know, it's business as usual. You know, there are just some disagreements here and there, but, you know, life goes on. You know, that's the stance of the President, right? Now, Of course, the downside of that is there's no clarity about the direction of this administration, right? And and again, the president taking a non-confrontational approach may actually, paradoxically, and we have seen this over and over again, dialectically even, has invited more and more bardagulan because, you know, when you sense the guy on top is, you know, uh, nonchalant, you're going to take the initiative into your own hands. And that's what we see, right? Proxies versus proxies, proxies versus the other camp, right? All of these things happening. But the good side also about this is that President Marcos Jr. is, he can keep his powder dry. And accordingly, since time is on his side, because he's the administration, resources are with his side, alliances and support from outside is towards his camp. He's just probably biding his time. And, you know, he knows that time is on his side. And as he gets closer and closer to election time, he will be in a strong position to dictate the terms of Philippine politics for the foreseeable future, especially if the pro Marcos camp does very, very well in the midterm elections and accordingly will be in a position to change the constitution altogether. So please check out yung vlog natin about constitutional change, different forms of constitutional change, CONAS, CONCON, Constitutional Convention, Constitutional Assembly, etc. Uh, we discuss all of the ramifications. But as I said, one option that, the, that, that is very, very doable, what the Marcos administration can do is to push for constitutional change, right? And they can completely prevent the return of the Duterte's because, you know, a lot of Duterte people are saying, okay, we're just going to wait this out. This is not our time, but there's 2028. And so far, if anyone were to bet, uh, bet, sorry, if anyone were to bet, including including yours truly, siyempre, sabihin mo si Sara pa rin yung front runner. I don't think a clear front runner anymore. I think Rafi Tulfo, for instance, could give him a run for her money. Or whatever money is going to be left by 2020. Uh, but, you know what I'm saying? Things could look very different by 2028. But there is a very big possibility that 
the 2020 elections might not even happen because if they change the constitution in 2025, then, I don't know, Martin Romualdez or someone like that could become prime minister and then Marcos could transition into becoming an increasingly ceremonial president potentially after 2028, right? He can maintain his position as a ceremonial president under a new constitution and then we'll move into a parliamentary system. And then under a parliamentary system, it's not about popularity per se, although of course popularity is still a big factor, but it's about parties. It's about number of votes you have in the legislature. And perhaps their calculation is that by that time they can so dominate the Philippine political landscape that they can, they can get enough people to form uh, the new, the, the next new dominant parliamentary government and coalition under the auspices of President Marcos Jr. So th there, there are so many possibilities here. Now, where do I stand on this? Oh, my thing is, again, just look at how many things we discussed over the past 40 minutes alone, right? There's so much going on in this country, right? SMNI could lose its franchise and they're going to lash back. They're not just going to sit back, right? You're going against a pretty pretty significant force. I won't say they're as powerful as before. Uh, the China situation is a big headache. Uh, the Philippines has to deal with all sorts of new opportunities and challenges as we see major realignments globally, no? geopolitically. At home also, you're seeing major realignments. So if you're President Marcus Jr., I see the point of at least rhetorically, not being non-confrontational. Uh, non but behind the scenes, he has to do what is necessary to prepare the ground for the domination of 2025 elections in ways that will prevent the other side from striking back at him. Because the other side is not, because the other side knows that time is not on their side, right? Uh, and that they need to s crawl their way back into power. So, you know, it, it's now all up to the groundwork that Marcos and his people are going to do. But in the meantime, I, again, as I said, you know, this has been my prediction through and through. You're not going to hear President Marcos Jr. this year coming out and saying, tapos na uni team and then awayin niya si Sara Duterte. That's not going to happen. It's just not the Marcos Jr. way, at least for now. And Marcos Jr. knows that time is on his side, momentum is on his side, and he has just so much on his plate, including so many other new travels, uh, including to travel to a very important Southeast Asian country next month, all right? Reveal nothing yet later on, right? Um, so, you know, why pick a fight when time is on your side and the more you wait, the stronger you get and the weaker the other side. So that means that if ever there's going to be a, another meltdown and showdown, it's because the other side will try to take the initiative. And that other side is also connected to bigger events, namely what's happening in South China Sea, because we know that, of course, different camps in the Philippines increasingly have different strategic patrons, meaning different superpowers backing them. On that note, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you appreciated this kind of uh, I mean, <laughs> tour, tour de France, right? Tour de France, like going all over the place. And I'm not going to discuss, but you know, that's what I do, all right? This is our bread and butter, you know, trying to keep, keep abreast with developments at home and abroad because we have to connect the two, two-level analysis. That's what I always do, right? And you cannot separate the two. On that note, thank you very much. A lot of Muslim support aside, and thank you to folks listening to us over space. Ayan, it looks like a number of folks that I saw them here 40, 45 minutes ago are still here. So thank you for for your attention span. Something very rare nowadays. Thank you also to some uh, supporters natin and followers natin on YouTube. And thank you very much also to our friends and Kametas on, on, on Facebook. Yes, it's true, it's true. Yeah, I know, I, I know I made that post uh last week and I said, you know, no production, no sponsors. And yet, you know, thank God, thanks to our passion and commitment, you know, we managed to make this the leading or among the leading political podcasts in the country and beyond. And of course, we landed in top 100 in Spotify uh, of all podcasts, of all podcasts, every genre podcast, and top 30 in Apple podcasts of all genre Apple podcasts in the country. So I'm very proud of that. But I know that I, that would not have been, uh, you know, possible without you guys providing support. So it's true, Walakum sponsors, it's true, Walakum production team ish. Right. Although we're kind of working on some, at least production when it comes to shorts and other kind of stuff. Thanks, hey Anton. Um, but you know, I know that none of this would have been possible if not for you guys supporting us, listening to us. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, sometimes we talk for an hour or two hours, right? Uh, and you guys are still there, and I see your comments coming in live. So we have multiple comments here. So I really appreciate it. In fact, including Dita's space, we have some friends asking questions. Let me see. All right. Okay. 
Alright, si GT Gerald So. Ayan. Go for gold na siya eh. Ayan. Wala na yung confidential fund. Yeah, that's also gonna be a big issue. We're gonna discuss it more. Sabi ni Ivan P, paki-check rin yung IP address ng mga quote-unquote or social media accounts ng mga itong mga quote-unquote think tanks ng mga quote-unquote experts na yan. Ibang klase ah. Oh, mga one-year-old lang mga think tanks na yan. Mga It's Japix. Alright, okay. Potemkin think tanks. That's a good way of putting it. But you know what? That's an insult to Potemkin. You know what? Actually, the Potemkin villages are nice villages in the Black Sea. And actually, Potemkin the person, yung dating lover ni Catherine the Great is among my favorite figures in history. Amazing guy. Amazing guy. Right? Alright. Uh, so please, let's not insult Potemkin. Okay. Thank you very much also sa mga sumusupport sa atin dito sa YouTube. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being there. And thank you also sa mga lahat ng mga sumusupport sa atin sa Facebook. All of you are my kameta. I appreciate it. And please continue. Continue to support us. And don't worry, in the coming days, we're arranging some sort of year-ender analysis. Of course, with pairing Ronaldo Liamas. Eh, mo kay Lisandro, Claudio, medyo out of reach yata siya ngayon. I'm, I'm sure he's you know trying to catch up with family and loved ones. And of course, you have Chris Tan, our good friend. We'll try to do another interview with him before we end the year. And then, kay, ano naman, yung isa naman na, ano, hindi na lang natin kung mag -guess. Anyway, my invitation has been out to everyone for collaboration. And well, I've been always open to working with people, to collaboration. I always believe that when we work together, we can do better, right? Uh, I never believe that one person alone can be the answer to everything, all right? And, you know, I'm quite secure with myself, so I, you know, I don't feel threatened by anyone, all right? Okay, thank you very much. God bless and talk to you soon. Salamat po. Thank you.